Well, the U.S. hitting Iran with more sanctions. The Treasury Department has announced new sanctions against 11 companies they say are operating on as a front on the behalf of the Iranian government. Now, the U.S. is vowing to ratchet up pressure on Iran. It's all an attempt to put an end to Iran's controversial nuclear program. But what are the true implications of these sanctions? Uh, what do they actually accomplish? To discuss this, Jamal Abdi, policy director for the National Iranian American Council, joins us now. Welcome, Jamal. Pleasure to have you Thanks, on the show. Um, so the U.S. already has sanctions in place. What do these new sanctions do? The, the fact of the matter is there's really not a whole lot left to sanction. Uh, so the new sanctions, they add some new names to the list of entities that are already sanctioned. Uh, most of the names that are actually listed have already been sanctioned because we have measures against all of the financial institutions inside of Iran. So really what this does is it's sort of a, a warning shot to other financial institutes around the world to say, look, we're starting to crack down on every entity inside of Iran, so you need to pull out completely from any operations you may still have remaining in the country. And so these sanctions um, are in addition to ones that are already exist. And the goal here is to break down Iran's nuclear program. Um, is there any indication that these existing sanctions in fact achieve that? Well, the sanctions, they've been sold as a means to not just contain Iran's nuclear progress, but also sold as a, a way to diplomatically end this crisis and to bring Iran to the table. That's what the administration says. That's what the advocates of sanctions say. But what we're finding is that when we actually came to the table with Iran, uh, the Iranians were ready to make a deal. They actually put on the table, we're willing to uh, end our, or freeze our enrichment at 20 percent, which is the most provocative element of its nuclear program in exchange for the U.S. leveraging some of its sanctions. And really what happened was we, we balked. We, you know, the U.S. said we think these sanctions are working so well we're actually going to double down on them. Uh, and so there was an opportunity for a, a sort of an interim deal and we decided that the sanctions were too valuable to give up. So now we have to ask ourselves are we committed to this track of sanctions for sanctions sake and if that's the case what is the real goal of the sanctions i think a lot of people in washington are starting to think that um, the, the goal is regime change and the idea is we can impose enough punishment inside of the country on ordinary iranians that somehow they're going to be compelled to rise up against the regime which you know iranians are not happy with the regime punishing them uh... through these sanctions is not the way to uh... To, to capitalize on that unhappiness. It's interesting that, that you bring up regime change because um, some members of, Wa of Washington are finding other ways to justify this. I uh, want to bring up this, um, this quote from the Treasury. Um, it states, uh, the identifications highlight Iran's attempt to evade sanctions through the use of front companies, as well as its attempts to conceal its tanker fleet by repainting, reflagging, or disabling GPS devices. So, I mean, what do you make of that accusation, Iran using these companies as, a, as front companies? It's, well, it's true. Um, and that's really the situation we have is we're playing whack-a-mole with uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, they, you know, they're going to find ways to evade the sanctions. We learned under the previous sanctions regime that looked a lot like the one we have against Iran, uh, the ones against Saddam in Iraq, that the regime always finds a way to evade the sanctions and ordinary people are the ones who can't find a way to evade them and end up suffering. And so when we have the Treasury, you know, sort of playing these games with the Iranians, okay, we issue sanctions, you figure out a way to evade them by flagging, uh, flagging uh, foreign ships or flagging your own ships under foreign flags or uh, figuring out ways to smuggle in goods, smuggle out oil, things like that. We can do that forever. But what we're finding is that there's, these tensions are starting to escalate out of control. Uh, we're, we're seeing this back and forth between the U.S. and Iran uh, that, that is going beyond just sanctions, but is actually starting to take on you know, these military dimensions. And I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to continue to play this game of whack-a-mole indefinitely. We're going to end up in a confrontation. Now, as you had mentioned, a lot of times these sanctions go beyond their attend intended effects and end up affecting you know, the everyday citizens in Iraq. And I had read today that um, they're affecting food prices food prices there in Iran are skyrocketing um, because of these sanctions. Can you talk more about that, about how these sanctions end up affecting, you know, the everyday citizens? 
Well, what they've done is they have severely impacted the, the price of basic goods, the price of food, things like that. And that's not just the sanctions. That also is the Iranian government, government's mismanagement of the economy. They've done a, a, a pretty good job of uh, making these sanctions have as big an impact as possible. Uh, but what the sanctions have done, I mean, sanctions have been in place for 30 years against Iran. And what we really have in Iran is a sanctions economy. And so you don't have uh, a, a strong middle class, a strong private sector. You have, uh, you know, industry and commercial activity dominated by the IRGC, the, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Iranian government, these state sponsored entities. And so while with the escalation of sanctions, food prices have gone through the roof. Um, uh, you know, increasingly, private business is forced out of uh, out of the economy. But the IRGC and the Iranian government's doing fine, and it's getting so bad that we're actually seeing that these sanctions are having an impact here in the United States. Uh, I was just going to mention that we did a story not too long ago about Apple refusing yeah. to sell um, iPads and, and other devices to Iranian Americans. So those those uh, those sanctions are, are reaching Iranian Americans, American citizens. And you know, on one hand, there's an issue of discrimination. You know, the civil rights here in the United States. We are claiming to, uh, with these sanctions, we have human rights sanctions. We have all these sanctions. We claim to be supporting uh, basic human rights around the world, and particularly in Iran, when the sanctions themselves are causing uh, civil rights here in the United States to be violated. More than that, we have uh, episodes in which. You know, Iranian Americans want to ship medicine uh, to family and uh, family that is sick in Iran. And they've been able to do this over the years. Uh, but now there's uh, certain medical products are not available in Iran due in part to the sanctions. And people who were shipping them to Iran previously are now being turned away at post offices and being told, look, you can't ship medical products to Iran. You can't ship medicine to a, a sick relative because of the sanctions. Well, I, I don't understand the point of that. That's to me sounds like collective punishment. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like I, this is going a lot further than what they intended. Um, and do, would you say that? I mean, we're hearing a lot of this rhetoric, um, you know, and a lot of fears about Iran developing its nuclear program. Uh, is there a danger that Iran's technical capabilities are exaggerated or, or blown out of proportion? Well, their technical capabilities um, have been blown out of proportion by a lot of folks who are eager for more hawkish measures. The fact of the matter is Iran uh, has a nuclear program and has not made a decision to actually weaponize that program. Now, you know, Frank, I believe that they want to get as close as possible to, you know, uh, to a, a threshold where they could uh, develop a weapon. I don't think, however, they would actually cross that threshold unless provoked. And so that's why when we talk about uh, escalation by sanctions or possible military action, we're really talking about pushing Iran's decision makers into making this decision that we don't want them to, to make, which is to actually develop a nuclear weapon. So you're saying it's provoking them to go ahead and develop that nuclear program? It's really, it's creating, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost guaranteeing that which we hope to present, prevent, which is Iran developing a nuclear weapon. There's still time. We can still use diplomacy. But the more we escalate, the more uh, the decision makers in Iran are pushed to actually pursue this, this path of weaponization. And it's extremely dangerous. And we got to find a way to switch, switch paths. All right. So new sanctions. It's sanctions, sanctions when it comes to Iran. They just keep coming. I mean, how can we expect Iran to react to, to this increased pressure? Well, I think, unfortunately, you know, Iran is not uh, well equipped to de-escalate the situation. Iran, uh, when they are sanctioned, or if there is an assassination inside of Iran, or if there is a, a, a you know a, a virus that's put into Iran's computers, the Stuxnet virus, things like this, Iran responds in kind. That's actually that's a decision that they made a while ago. That instead of seeking compromise, if they're provoked, they're going to provoke back. And so already we see that they don't have a lot of options to respond other than these extremely dangerous, uh, provocative, you know, either military maneuvers or threats to, uh, to, to mine the Strait of Hormuz, through which a lot of the world's energy supplies move through. Um, or they've even threatened to, you know, increase the level at which they enrich uranium to uh, a closer to a weapons grade, getting them closer to this, thresh this threshold. And they're using the excuse of, 
we're going to build these uh, nuclear-powered submarines or nuclear-powered ships. These are all actions that are derived from, uh, from U.S. actions and actions of, you know, the Israelis who are also conducting these, uh, these you know, bombings inside of Iran. And then the other thing that Iran has done, and, you know, we don't have the, the facts, the evidence yet, but there seems to be indications that uh, there was an attack in Bulgaria today. Uh, the Israelis are pointing the finger at Iran. I frankly wouldn't be surprised if Iran was behind those attacks. And this is a tit for tat. Um, the, the minute we find a way to de-escalate, then we can actually start to prevent Iran from taking these actions. But as long as we continue down this road, they're going to continue to do the exact same thing that we're doing against them. All right. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, elements at play here. Jamal, thank you so much for coming to the studio. Appreciate it. That was uh, Jamal Abdi. He's the policy director of the National Iranian American Council.